All right. Well, it is now six o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, thank you all for joining. Good evening. Um, my name is David Hugo, and I'm Sea Grant's South Atlantic Reef Fish Extension and Communication Fellow. I'm really excited to kick off this three-part series. Um, just as a quick reminder, this, this three-part webinar series is really designed to be an educational resource for anyone interested in ongoing reef fish research, um, particularly in the South Atlantic. Um, each webinar will begin with a guest presentation on a particular research area, followed by a question and answer session. Um, these are really meant to be interactive, so we um, encourage you to take advantage of the question and answer session at the end. Um, in a moment, I'll go ahead and pass the baton to tonight's guest speaker, but before I do, I'd like to mention a few um, housekeeping things. Um, GoToWebinar, which is the platform we're using, has automatically muted everyone. Um, once our guest speaker finishes his presentation, um, we'll begin our Q&A session, and at that time, my team and I will have the opportunity to unmute participants individually to allow for questions. Um, if you guys have any technical difficulties at any point during the webinar, please do use the chat or reach out to us um, to let us know. We're happy to try to troubleshoot and get you back in order um, to kind of view it as seamlessly as possible. So without further ado, um, we'll jump straight into things. Um, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Wally Bubbly. Dr. Bubbly is an associate marine scientist at South Carolina's Department of Natural Resources, or SCDNR, and the lead biologist for SCDNR's Reef Fish Survey's Life History Lab Fishery Dependent Program and the principal investigator for the MARMAP program, which he'll talk a little bit about. Tonight, he'll be providing some background into some of the offshore reef fish surveying efforts taking place in the South Atlantic. Wally, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be here tonight. I will go ahead and pass things off to you. Fantastic. Well, thanks for having me here tonight and really glad to, to be here to talk to you all about something I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis while working with South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. So as David said, I'm one of the principal investigators for the South Carolina DNR Reef Fish Survey that's funded through NOAA Fisheries. And I've been involved with it for over a decade, um, coming in as a grad student, leaving and eventually coming back and, and have been in this position for roughly 10 years now. So I hope to relay some of the information that I've learned through the years. You may have heard friends or even your mother tell you, don't worry, there's plenty of fish in the sea after going through some sort of breakup in, during your life, some period, but that doesn't always tell the whole story. And just like dating, surveying fish populations can be complicated. There are many challenges associated with surveying these fish populations, especially in the open ocean. So this evening, I wanna discuss how these reef fish populations are surveyed in the Atlantic Ocean off the Southeastern United States, not only including these challenges, but how we go about addressing them as well. So you may notice the word surveying's used here, not counting or a census. And that's because unlike certain other undersea creatures, fish don't have driver's license that help us get an idea of how many uh, how many are out there, which is, as we discussed, my mother just said, there, there are plenty, and obviously there's too many to count. So because of this, we need to find a way to survey the population by using a small subset of the whole that's representative, and hopefully that'll tell us something about the larger population. And by representative, I mean that the sample will give us an idea of what's out there. So one of the components that we'd be looking at is the species composition in the region. It's important to examine the diversity of the fish at a location, and it gives us an understanding of how that ecosystem functions. So we can see that there are larger predators, like I'm trying to wait for one of these scamps to swim by, uh, but we have larger predators that are there. We also have uh, prey species like the tom tape, these smaller, fish that have the, the dots on their tails swimming around. Um, we also have species like lionfish that are invasive species that are showing up in, in this uh, gear. So all of this is important to understand. Additionally, um, we want to know some idea about the abundance of the number of fish that are out there. And a lot of people think that this is a really important aspect that come out of these monitoring efforts. And while they're not wrong, it may not paint a complete picture without other information um, 
of the, the fish that we're catching. Like the, one, two, click, like the demographics of those fish. So things such as size, age, sex ratio, spawning season, maturity, all of these factors can give us an understanding of how the fish population is currently and potentially what it looked like in the past or will look like in the future. So there can be major red flags if say the size of or age of individuals in a population are skewed in one direction. It could give fishery managers an idea of what the best way is to manage that population. So let's say for example, a population made up of mostly smaller and younger fish can indicate that fishing pressure may be targeting the larger fish and truncating that size or age distribution that's causing this imbalance. But it does give us hope because those smaller fish and younger fish will grow up to be bigger and older fish one day as long as they, they're allowed to get to that point. The inverse of that though may be more worrisome because maybe there's no smaller or younger fish in the population or fewer. And this can indicate that some sort of recruitment failure might be happening but unfortunately, that's probably out of the control of the, the fisheries managers. So a couple of the methods for surveying fish populations that I'll get into today, or there's, there are a few methods, but I'm going to talk about two of them today. Uh, the first one is fishery dependent surveys. And just as the name implies, they rely on the commercial and recreational fisheries to catch fish, and then data are collected from them to characterize the fish populations. So one of the advantages of this is that it's extremely large scale. There's an estimated 9.3 billion pounds of seafood landed in the commercial fishery each year worth roughly $5.5 billion. And then there's an additional 14.3 million saltwater anglers making an estimated 187 million trips a year. So that's a lot of activity out of the water to potentially inform management decisions. The drawbacks of some of these types of surveys though are that they're subject to the fishery management regulations. Uh, such as size limits, bag limits, quotas, gear restrictions, close seasons, all of this, this, these can skew the data to be more reflective of the management and not necessarily the populations. So additionally, with all those people on the water, there are infinite number of combinations of fishing gear, bait, tackle, locations, conditions, time, day, year, all these things that can actually affect um, the catch and so that leads us to some inconsistencies with uncertainty of if the fish being caught are a function of the numbers of the fish in the population, the strategies used to catch them, or some combination of the two. So it can be really difficult to try to disentangle these from each other. The second type of survey is a fishery independent survey. And just as before, as the name implies, it's not dependent on the fishery. So it's not subject to management regulations. Thus, theoretically, it allows more complete picture of the entire population, not just those individuals that fit into those regulations. So fishery independent surveys can collect undersized fish theoretically over the bag limit, using restricted gear during a closed season or area. So all of this is being done in a consistent manner, which helps to eliminate outside factors from affecting the results. The consistency is in the gear, the bait, how it's deployed, how it's retrieved, what areas and times it's fished. All of these things go into hopefully maintaining this consistent sampling effort. So if we do happen to see a change in the catch from year to year, that can be attributed to changes in the population size. So these surveys can also collect a lot of very precise data, meaning that if any external factor is, showing, is shown to have an effect, then adjustments can be made in the analysis after the fact. The, the largest downside of this is you know, the inverse of the fishery dependent sampling in, in that the surveys are relatively expensive to run and they're a lot smaller scale since you only have the trained scientists running off of limited research vessels. So because these two types of surveys are drastically different, Things like species abundance and the demographics characterized by them can be drastically different, causing some to question who is actually sampling the real population. So let's explore this a little bit. So commercial fishers may be restricted by things like regulations or even market price. So they may target a specific size fish and most likely larger based on how I've always gone out fishing. So 
what kind of discrepancies between fishery independent and fishery dependent uh, demographic data or this this can cause these discrepancies between those two types of surveys um, in this case we'll look at lengths so these are real data that were collected by two means you can see the the fishery dependent data is in the yellow fishery independent data is the green and you see that the fishery dependent data has a much higher mean length than the fishery independent collect data that was collected so it's showing that there's differences between these two methods even though they were sampling supposedly the same population so what i want to get to is i want to start with a brief history of the survey efforts of reef fish in the region and focus on the chevron video trap survey since that's the one that's predominantly used to provide data for federally managed reef fish species but I will mention the utility of some of the other ones that are in the region and, and complement this survey. The, so this, the Chevron video trap survey is a fishery independent survey that's been executed in a relatively consistent manner since 1990 under the MARMAP program, which stands for the Marine Resources Monitoring, Assessment and Prediction, um, of which some of you in the region may be familiar with or at least heard of. So this program's housed at the Marine Resources Research Institute in Charleston within the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, but it is federally funded effort by NOAA Fisheries. So this survey was designed to monitor a large variety of managed species with drastically different sizes and behaviors. So the intent was to find some gear that would optimize catch of these species as a whole, um, which is why the Chevron trap was, show, was chosen though it might not be optimal for any of these particular species. As long as it's consistent, that's what's really mattering here. So you can see the chevron trap in this, this photo. It's roughly six feet long or so, about two feet high. What we do is we bait it with menhaden prior to deploying it at our stations. Um, and as I mentioned, the gear and the methods have been consistent over the, the, the survey, at least in this portion of it that I'm talking about from 1990 to 2009, these 20 years. Then beginning in 2010, we had two additional federal partners join with the Mar with MarMap for these efforts. One was the Southeast Area Monitoring Assessment, the Monitoring and Assessment Program, so CMAP, um, which is also based in Charleston. And the other is the Southeast Fishery Independent Survey, also known as CFIS, that's based at the Southeast Fishery Science Center in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, and these provide additional funding, resources, and staff for this survey. So while doing this and just making this a larger survey in general, they also added some important additions of video cameras on all the traps. So this collaborative effort is known as SURFs from this point on, um, if I, you hear me refer to it, that's the Southeast Refish Survey. So as you can see, we really love acronyms in this field, but I'm gonna try to keep them as minimum, to a minimum as possible, but I can't promise anything. So what happened when these partners came on was we employed the same methodology as we had over the previous 20 years. There are just a lot more resources to run it. Uh, the big change were these video cameras, and this is a really big advancement in that they provided additional information about the fish populations and habitats uh, that they lived. So in the past, if we put a trap down in the water and it came up with nothing, we didn't know why. We didn't know if, if we missed the spot that we were trying to hit, if there were no fish down there, or if the fish just didn't want to go in the trap. So these cameras provide an additional source of information to determine the population trends compared to the catch in the traps, but also providing additional information on species that we don't typically get catch in these traps due to size or behavior. So I won't get into the video component in particular too much today, but I did want to let you know that it's, it's a very complementary portion to the catch in the Chevron traps. So we currently cover an area from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina in the north to St. Lucie Inlet in Florida to the south at depths anywhere from 50 feet out to 360 feet. The video traps are deployed on low to medium relief hard bottom habitat that are randomly selected from a universe of about 4,300 stations that we have over in uh, mapped within this area. 
And the survey takes place between April and October every year, and the traps are deployed during daylight hours. So as I mentioned, we try to be consistent with all of this. We currently have three vessels that are in use between the groups. The RV Palmetto, which is on the top, it's housed here in Charleston, South Carolina. The RV Savannah, which as you guessed it, is housed in Savannah, Georgia. And the NOAA ship Pisces with home port of Pascagoula, Mississippi, but it can't operate out of Moorhead City, North Carolina when working in the Atlantic. So we coordinate sampling amongst all of these groups so we don't duplicate efforts as multiple vessels may be out at the same time. Um, and we attempt to uh, sample roughly 1,500 or so stations a year, but we don't repeat any and we keep a certain distance apart between all of those stations just so we're not, we're not influencing uh, other stations by the catch or by having the bait down there. So I want to give you an example of kind of the crew on one of these, these vessels, and I'll let you know how the RV Palmetto operates, as this is the one I'm most familiar with. So typically we carry about seven to nine scientists and five to six vessel crew for trips up to 10 days at a time. And that 10 day limit is basically how much fresh water we can hold. Um, and after about 10 days and the, the fresh water runs out, definitely is worthwhile going home because if we can't take showers and we've been out on the back deck for a long time in the hot sun dealing with a lot of flopping fish, it's not a pleasant place to be. So these traps are dropped as we pass over the selected stations. Um, as you can see, as they're sending this over, we have a, a system of buoys and ropes that basically attach from the bottom um, to the top so we can retrieve them. So these traps will drop down to the bottom, as you can see here, and hopefully hit the spots that we're aiming for as we're, we're doing this. But when they land at their spots, they sit there for roughly 60 minutes before we retrieve them. So we have, for efficiency sake, we basically put sets of six traps down at a time, wait for that hour and a half to come through, and then eventually we will come back around and pick them up in the order that we, we deploy them. And so when they're sitting at the bottom, obviously the cameras are rolling and we're getting this awesome footage. And this is one of my favorite things to do is after we pick up the trap is to see what kind of stuff is down there. We see what happens in the, the traps as they come up, but this gives us an idea of some stuff like this sandbar shark that we would have never known was down there if we didn't have these video cameras there. And so hopefully these traps are catching fish as it's happened, as we're going through this process. We then use a, a hydraulic pot hauler lift this trap up to the surface, and then we have the fish that are flopping around in there, and we take them, empty it, and then we begin the process of characterizing the, the catch that we have, uh, that we had in that trap. And so what this does is it involves recording a lot of data. And by a lot of data, I mean a lot of data, and it happens for each deployment, Every video trap is tagged with a unique collection a number attached to the trap. As you can see, that black sea bass was exploring it and made it a little more difficult on us because it wasn't on the trap when he came back up. But from that point, we assign all of the data for that trap that we collect using electronic fish measuring boards um, to get the information straight into our database. So this information includes every fish being identified down the species if possible counted and measured. So certain species at this point are retained so that we can gather additional tissues to get information on things like ages of fish, such as otoliths. Um, and these are calcium carbonate structures in the inner ear of the fish that's responsible for orientation. But luckily for us, they lay down bands similar to tree rings. So we can look at these, process them back at the lab and get some estimate of how old that, act, that fish is. Uh, we also take reproductive tissue from selected species, and we do this to examine things like sex ratio and maturity, or when this fish is spawning, or how many eggs that this fish has over that time period. So this is all important information that helps inform an, assess an assessment. Now through 33 years of the Chevron Video Trap Survey, we've ended up 
capturing overall 845,000 plus fish. Um, annually, about 25,000 fish we encounter between us and our, our partners. So this is a pretty big number and it's coming from annually about 52 species, but overall we've captured in these chevron traps 159 different species. We've also taken over 5,000 life history samples annually, amounting to over 175,000 in all over this time period. Um, <clears throat> I'm not even getting into the, the month's worth of video recordings from, from the cameras either. And that's a completely different story. And that's something that our, our federal partners in Beaufort uh, deal with a lot more than us. So after deployment of the, the video traps, we also take information about the environment by deploying a CTD. And this measures salinity, temperature, and depth, amongst other things, for every set uh, of the video traps that we drop. So this additional information is useful to explore how these variables can affect the catch. So we can adjust for that at a later time, if need be. The video cameras also provide us information on the habitat, such as the type of habitat. So you can see in this picture, there's there's some ledges, there's some rocky outcrops. Um, <clears throat> gives us an idea of what's growing on those, those rocks. It tells us what proportion of the ocean floor is covered by this habitat. Um, we could also look at things like current direction or current speed that can also affect the, the catch of fish or those fish that are visible in the videos. So I mentioned that there's challenges faced to ensure that the, the video traps give us a picture that's representative of the actual population. And I'll go into that further here. So question is, why is it so difficult to get this representative sample? Well, first off, the ocean's really big. As you probably know, it makes up greater than 70% of the Earth's surface and is on average over two miles deep. So that's a, it's a big area to cover and fish can inhabit any of that, that area. So you pair that with our inability to breathe underwater, and we're essentially trying to survey something that you can't really get a direct observation from any distance um, in its own natural environment. On top of that, the ocean floor is not all the same. The hard bottom habitat that we sample can be really patchy, so that there can be large distances of just flat sand that's pretty much like a desert in between the reefs that we're targeting. And finally, the cherry on top is that different species, life stages, or even sexes of within the same species may actually prefer different types of habitat. So this could be due to a lot of factors, such as the, the habitat structure itself, and maybe the fish likes to hide in, in certain crevices, and so it finds some sort of habitat a little bit better. Um, maybe their prey likes to hide in some of these crevices a little bit better, so they, they go to these areas. There's also things like depth. We have certain species that that are present in deeper water and not shallow, or shallow or deep and not deeper, or all over the place. Or some of them change as they grow. Some of them will be start off in shallow water when they're younger and grow to deeper water later. Uh, the same applies with temperature or season. So if we're sampling one spot in May, we're sampling that same spot in September, we might come up with completely different fish assemblages. So what I'm saying is that you can understand that this starts to get really complicated really quickly when we're trying to get a, a good picture of what's actually down there. So with these first three challenges being similar in nature, I'm going to try to use this analogy to tackle all three. And I really like this one. I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty um, intuitive. So let's think of our survey as trying to figure out how many people are at a college sporting event but we don't have the capabilities of counting the number of tickets sold or all of the people there. There's a lot there. So what we're trying to do is get a number by only looking at a small subset of the fans in the stands and hoping that if we extrapolate it out, it gives us something close to what the true estimate is. The only problem though is because some of these seats, such as those near the midfield are preferred, just like sampling those best locations maybe. Uh, the best reef locations, this may be misleading since those seats are often taken regardless of how many fans are in the stands. Uh, these abundance estimates that would come out of that are the same regardless of how many people are there if we just sample this one area. And on top of that, we might not get a good idea of the typical demographics of someone attending the game as those seats may be sold most often to 
wealthy alumni that have the money to afford the tickets, not the students that might make up the majority of the crowd. While other less optimal seats may actually tell us a lot more about the attendance. So if people are in the nosebleed seats, there's probably a good chance that the game has a lot more people in attendance than if there weren't any there at all. So this analogy helps to explain why we don't always go to the locations where we know we'll catch a lot of fish. Those habitats that have marginal, that are marginal or poor, may actually give us a better understanding of what's happening with the population than if we just went to those best spots. If the population level is high, there may be so much competition for space and resources like food that there's spillover from these best habitats to these marginal or poor ones. And if we just sample those best locations, we would get a fairly consistent estimate, even though the population might be fluctuating quite a bit. So there's also a reason, this is also the reason that fishery independent surveys have an advantage over those fishery dependent surveys when trying to trend assess the trends of fish populations. So because a commercial fisher is dependent on catching fish for their livelihood, and so they need to make their mortgage payment, they need to make their boat payment or their truck payments. So they obviously are gonna target the best locations, the areas they can catch the most fish the fastest. And if they don't catch anything at that one spot, they move to another location until they do catch the same, the amount that they're allowed to bring in for the trip. So this means that even if it becomes more difficult to catch the fish, the amount they're landing may still basically be similar throughout the, the time period, even if the population is decreasing because they're, they're spending more effort and time to find it. And then by the time it may get to the point where there's so few fish that they can't meet those trip limits, the damage may have already been done. So let's walk through this exercise show some similarities here. So the ocean is big and holds a lot of fish. The stadium is big and holds a lot of fans. So we have that similarity already. As I mentioned before, some of the seats are, are more preferable and likely to be filled. But even then, some fans may prefer different locations. Maybe somebody likes to sit a little higher up so they can get a better view over all of the, the field. Um, so we would then have to figure out how to get this representative sample of the crowd that accounts for these. And it wouldn't just be looking at those one one location. So what we would do is we would look at a lot of different samples from randomly selected spots all over the stadium. So based on just sheer volume, this provides us a more likely probability to get some representative sample because we get spots where there are a lot of fans, like by the midfield. We get some with no fans in the corners and everything in between. So the hope is by randomly selecting these spots, we can get something that's representative of what's actually being shown at the at the stadium or in fish case in the ocean. And this is basically what we do. We have this station list, as I mentioned before, and as these stations, um, we select these stations from this universe of known hard bottom habitat. In the early years, we averaged over 300 traps deployed per year when it was just MarMap and we just used the RV Palmetto to cover this entire region. And you can see generally the spatial scale of these in the, on the left. <clears throat> but is there a way to improve upon this strategy and get results that we'd have even more confidence in? And the answer is yes. And the way that we handled it was more samples. They were randomly selected again and the higher number of samples that we had, the less likely we were to get some sort of weird outlier result due to the smaller sample size. And thus we have a lot more confidence in our estimates. There are many other methods to design sampling effort to minimize bias, but I'm not gonna get into those today since this is the method that we currently use in the Atlantic waters off the Southeastern United States. And as you can see, when you're comparing the two of them, we had a lot more effort when the other two partners came on and we had access to the other vessels starting in 2010. In fact, the sampling effort in the region quadrupled and you can see that there's a lot of areas that weren't as heavily sampled, say off of Florida or off of North Carolina, that are now a lot more densely sampled. So it gives us a better understanding or at least more confident understanding in what is out there and, and we feel comfortable with our data. You might be asking yourself though, why didn't we just have the survey begin in 2010 or 11? 
when uh, when those partners came on and we had those large increases in sampling. Well, one of the reasons that goes along with with surveys is that um, the abundance values are relative to other years in the time series. So if you look at this plot on the right, this is for red grouper. And so I know there's a lot on here, just kind of narrow it down on the, the bottom axis, the X axis is year from 2011 to 2021. On the, the side axis or the Y axis, it's basically the relative abundance of, of these fish. And if you follow that, that darker red or black line, they, they trend roughly the same. So there might be a slight decrease, but relatively, they stay relatively stable over that whole time period. Um, with just some fluctuations from year to year. However, we look back at the at this in context of that full time series of the trap survey, we see something completely different. That we see that in these most recent years, yeah, the population level seems to be stable, but it's stable at a really low level compared to where they were, their red grouper catches were historically. And so this kind of gives a, a really good picture and exemplifies why a longer time series of data is better to get a full picture of what the population is actually doing. And the final challenge I'll talk about today is selectivity of the gear used in the survey. So whether it has to do with mesh size of a net or a trap, or the size of the opening in a trap, or the hook size when using rod and reel, these gears may target different sizes or species of fish and it's just worth noting that all gear is selective in some form. Well, mostly. So it's, I still love this picture. This was a, a fish that we caught on a long line and it's it was caught on a hook that was almost the same size as it was. And the funny thing was it didn't actually get hooked. Um, it swam in between the, the barb of the hook and the, the shaft and then apparently we started to lift up the gear and it got spooked and flared its gills out. And so it turned and in turn got itself wedged in that, that gap. And so because it couldn't relax on the way up, we ended up getting the chance to see it at the surface because it, it made it to the surface even though it didn't actually get hooked on the, the hook itself. So when it comes to this, maybe these fish species aren't attracted to bait. So maybe we won't see them in the trap catches that way. Maybe it's too small, so it doesn't fit through the mesh. Or in this instance, maybe it's a little too big to fit inside the trap. And this is obviously something that we see occasionally with uh, certain species, a lot of the shark species and some others. So it gives us an idea of um, what's actually happening with while we're down there and um, we, try to account for that. However, people tend to underestimate the size of the fish that can actually get into the trap if they want to. So this red snapper who sees working his way in ended up being over 34 inches long and weighed over 28 pounds. So this is a pretty big fish. And we've actually caught even larger red snapper than that. Um, shape of the fish is gonna play some role as to what actually fits in these traps, but we've caught cobia that are over four feet long in the trap. One time we caught a Warsaw grouper that weighed over 62 pounds and we actually had to cut open the trap because it wouldn't fit through the doors that we normally empty the catch out of. So one way that we account for the selectivity of the gear is to adjust after the fact. And this plot on the right is called a selectivity curve. And the way that it works is that a value of one essentially means that this is the age that the fish is most likely to be caught by that year. And in this case, it's age three fish is up at the up at the, the value for one. So then go down to say age 10, and that value is roughly 35%. So we can correct the number of age 10 fish in the population with the knowledge that we only captured roughly 35% of what would have been there um, if it had been fully selected. So we just multiply it by a factor to, to raise that. So these selectivity curves can be created within the assessment models based on catches at age, or they can be created outside of these models using some comparative studies, like one that's nearing completion that we're working with right now using stereo video cameras. And that's this picture on the left. So we can obtain length measurements from 
the cameras using um, because there's there's two of them at a certain distance apart from each other. And so this is essentially how our eyes work in terms of giving us depth perception is that it's a known distance between the two and their cameras are slightly angled in to give us this overlapping field of view. We can then uh, use a computer program and have somebody put a line on the fish to measure it. And it uses the differences between the two pictures, the one from the left camera and the one from the right camera, and it can give us a length estimate. So this can gives us a direct comparison uh, regarding the size of the fish in the videos and the size of the fish we catch because they're connected to each other. The, the stereo camera is connected to the trap. And so we're looking at the same individual fish. We also can account for some of the shortcomings in the selectivity by combining with other gears that sample those ages and sizes better. So cameras are the prime example of this. They tend not to have the same selectivities as the traps. So they really do complement each other pretty well. And because they're deployed on the traps, this is an opportunity to examine these species that don't go into the traps as often. They may still hang around the trap and get picked up in the videos though. So there are a number of species that fits this bill. Some of them like Goliath grouper or the shark species like the white shark that I showed are too large to fit in the traps, but others like hogfish or lionfish, which are pretty prevalent around the traps, but hardly get caught in them because they're not interested in the bait. So these data in conjunction with the, the catch information provide a much more robust depiction of what many of these fish stocks look like. We also have paired trapping efforts with hook and line methods using both really small hooks, like shown here with ran into some small red snapper, as well as some much larger hook sizes. So we can fill out some of those size gaps that are missed by the shutter on trap. A third method that we've utilized in the past to collect different sizes or species is long line gear. So in this case, this is a short bottom long line that we deployed in deeper and higher relief habitat, stuff, areas that, that traps really don't work well in or would get stuck in. So this allows us to catch species that are not typically encountered in the traps, like the snowy grouper. Um, additionally, we're partners in a cooperative longline survey with commercial participants to collect fishery independent data off of industry vessels with observers on board. So this hybrid approach really allows us to, to obtain uh, some of these samples and data in a much more efficient matter, manner it utilizes the vast knowledge of the industry participants in terms of how we're gonna fish and where we're gonna fish. And then it helps us collect quality data that can be used in assessments, but it also develops partnerships with these commercial participants, which is really helpful to have, have them understand why we're doing what we're doing and be on board with it. Another means of addressing gear selectivity is using different meshes on the gear. So in this case, because some of these fish are small enough they can swim through the chevron trap mesh, what we did is we used a smaller bait fish trap that has smaller mesh. So it retains a lot of these uh, smaller individuals, which are hopefully juveniles of species that we catch as adults in the traps. So this, this took place mostly in shallow water since there are some species that are known to move offshore um, into the deeper water as they get bigger. And this goes along with with a uh, trawl survey as well, where they are sampling the shallower water and hoping to catch these juveniles in nets um, before they move offshore. So by utilizing all of these different means of capturing fish that have these different selectivities, we get a better understanding of what's truly out there and not just the picture of what one gear is telling us. So because of the length of the the survey and the fact that it's designed for multiple species, these data have gotten a lot of use in the assessment process. So data have, provided, have been provided for 34 assessments in the region covering 14 different species. And we're typically providing abundance indices to see how the population is doing, length and age compositions to see what the demographics of size are, size and age data to try to estimate growth, reproductive information to examine maturity, sex ratios, spawning and fecundity, like I mentioned before, uh, distribution patterns, where we're catching the fish and what time of year, what kind of density they're in, and morphometrics, which is essentially just dealing with conversions between lengths and weights 
because a lot of these these fishery dependent samples might come in as just a weight or just might come in as just numbers of individuals so we have a way to convert there to get everything on the same playing field and in addition to this we work with south atlantic fishery management council if they ask us about cer certain characteristics of the stock that could have an effect on management regulations that are ongoing or being considered so in all, these data can be used to ensure that the fisheries can maintain a certain level of catch while also ensuring that the, the fish are around in the future. So though monitoring fish populations may be a little more involved than you probably originally thought, I hope that I provided some information today that will make understanding the surveying of fish populations a little less complicated which makes it better for everyone so i hope you take home a few points that i discussed today such as the the length of the survey and the consistent methodology are really vital for the survey to provide useful information also because we're not taking a census of the entire population our survey has to collect a subset of the data that's representative of the population including species abundance and demographics. And by using some forethought prior to beginning the sampling effort, a survey can really be a reliable method of characterizing these fish populations. So now I figured this would be a, a fun one to, to end on because this is just a highlight video of what has happened in previous years. So there'll be a bunch of fun picture or fish videos and you can feel free to ask questions as as these are playing through. Awesome, thanks so much, Wally. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, with the question and answer session. Um, just a quick couple things. Um, like I mentioned to kind of kick things off, um, you all have been muted, um, but do not worry, we can unmute you. If you have a question, um, we just ask it to raise your hand. Um, to do that, there's kind of the side panel where you can kind of see the attendees list and things like that. And then there's a little bit of a kind of small gray bar next to it that you'll see a hand icon and then um, like a microphone as well. So just raise your hand and I've got a team of us that'll kind of keep track of the order that hands are raised and we'll um, kind of call you out one by one. And when we call you out, we will unmute you. Um, we ask that you kind of ask your question and then um, go ahead and mute yourself. So that's just gonna be pressing that microphone again. So when you're unmuted, that microphone will be green. When you are muted, it'll be back red. Um, and like I said, we'll be keeping track of the order of people um, on our end. Um, so I will go ahead and, and kick things off. If, if you guys have questions, feel free to just raise your hand and we will um, go from there. But in the meantime, feel free to just view some of this really cool footage while he's provided. So. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. These are a bunch of Goliath grouper that we just happened to come across. They stayed around the traps for quite a while. There, there is a question on here. I'm not sure who asked it. David, I don't know if you can give yeah. that information, but. Yeah, sorry, my, my computer was doing the weird stuff for a second. Um, all right, looks like there's a few people in the queue with their hands raised. Um, yes, uh, questions can be typed as well. Um, and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll probably, just because we don't have a, know the order there, we'll probably address those at the end. I also, one thing to note is um, if there's a question that's kind of outstanding when and we kind of run out of time tonight, um, please do type them in the chat and I will kind of create a follow-up document and share it with you all. Um, and this webinar is also recorded as well. So um, looks like the first hand we have raised is Janelle Fleming. Let me go ahead and try to unmute you. Hi. Jenny Otto. Hello. Hello. Got you. 
<laughs> okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, nice work, uh, definitely very, very cool. I was just wondering if in the future there were going to be ways to do it non-invasively, where you rely more on video technology instead of using the, sh the full chevron chops, maybe just using the bait to bring the organisms over there and then just relying more on the video work instead? Yeah, and that's that's something that they've gone to more in the Gulf recently. They have a video survey that they they utilize. One of the the drawbacks of doing it, it's great because yeah, you're not removing the fish and you get a better understanding of, of or at least you're not you're not taking out them out of the environment. But one of the things that we don't get information on at that point is any age information. And that's actually plays a really big role in these assessment models because they look and track like your classes of fish through time. And that's one of the important components that that the model focuses in on to try to try to make sense of how the population's doing. And by not removing them, we lose that sort of information. Um, using those stereo cameras, we can get a better idea of length. So that can be correlated with age at times, but some of the fish species that we use are just, or some, some of the fish species that we, we see just there's not there's a big wide range of how old those fish are. I mean, it could be anywhere from a two to a 20 year old fish based on the length. So it makes it a little more tricky with that aspect of it. So, um, well, in theory, I think that's really good. I'm not sure in the Atlantic, at least, we're planning on moving anytime shortly. Uh, and looks like we've got a next question is in the chat. Um, what are the other surveys that exist south and north of where SURF does their survey? All right, so south of us, there's not a lot. Uh, the state of Florida does some some work that overlaps with where we are. Um, and so they'll get information on on uh, using some hook and line methods. They'll sample with some traps uh, in the Florida Keys. There's a diver-based survey that they have going forward uh, with that, as well as in the Caribbean. Um, north, it's it's just dependent on what what species they're going after. Uh, at about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, there's a biogeographic break, meaning there's a lot different fish assemblages up there than there are down here, and the bottom's different. So a lot of times they'll use, there's a trawl survey that goes from by the Canadian border all the way through North Carolina twice a year. So that's one thing that uh, they're consistently getting information from. And a lot of the states have their own surveys that sometimes it's just closer to shore uh, survey efforts. Sometimes it's further out, it just depends. There's a lot of people working on this sort of thing. And so when we have assessments come up, a, a lot of effort is spent trying to figure out how to mesh all of the, the data together. Awesome. And the next question we have is, um, have you thought of trying to use lasers for fish measurements combined with the underwater cameras? Yeah, so lasers are, it kind of does the same thing the stereo cameras would do. So the lasers would give us, typically though, for anybody who doesn't know with this, is they have two lasers that are spread a certain distance apart. And so if it happens to hit a fish, we know that that distance, say, six inches then um, we can extrapolate out the length of the fish based on how long the six inches were. Um, a problem with lasers sometimes is that certain fish are really attracted to them and certain fish are really scared of them. And so we don't always get a good representative sample of the assemblages that are there because we are only seeing the ones that maybe like the, the lights. We're not seeing the ones that are scared of them and, and run and hide from them. All right, the next question is um, from Jenny. Um, Jenny, we'll go ahead and unmute you and then you can ask your question. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Hi, my question is, how many times per year do you drop the chevron traps? Is it pretty continuous or is it just seasonal? 
So it's, I, I guess it's seasonal in nature. We have to actually work around the right whale migration patterns. So we can start dropping traps in mid-April. We have to stop by mid-October. And it's really weather dependent at that point. So any time during that time period, we can be dropping traps, but it's just when we have the opportunity. So the, the group that I'm with at South Carolina DNR has roughly 40 to 50 sea days typically that we make a year. And then our partners make something similar to that as well. So over the course of that time, we're out at sea for a hundred or so days, but a lot of those days could be overlapping. So it just, it kind of depends and it's, it's weather specific as to how continuous it is. We like to have it spread out as much as possible because we don't, as I mentioned, some of this stuff can be seasonal. So if we do all of our sampling in May, then what happens if the populations look different or different uh, species move in in September or August or something like that? All right, next question is from Victor. Um, I'm having trouble viewing the chat. It looks like you wrote a, wrote a chat there, but if you if you have the opportunity, do you mind? Um, we can try to unmute you and then have you say your question. I think this is a problem on my end, but. Uh, yeah, the question is, if you see the use of artificial intelligence in the surveys anytime in the future and how that can impact the uh, outcome of the surveys. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that anybody who's in my group would agree with is the fact that these videos, while they're really easy to collect, all we do is just throw them on a trap, turn them on and throw them in the water. And they come back and they have an hour and a half of video on them. That hour and a half of video may end up taking five, six, seven hours to read because you're trying to identify every single fish out there. You're trying to count every single fish out there. So use of AI, if they could get down to the point where they can identify species well and get counts, that would be a big game changer in terms of the use of the videos. Because as of right now, that's kind of our limiting factors. We don't have an opportunity to, to look at the videos nearly as in depth as we would like to either. So we just, we try to make do with the best that we can and AI would be fantastic with that. The problem is in this region, at least, we have a lot of different species and we have a lot of different species that re look really similar to each other. So I think in the, the initial models, some of the stuff that they've tried to look at, it, it works okay, but it's not quite to the point to the resolution that we need it to be. All right, our next question is from Steve. Um, what are you seeing with respect to red snapper abundance and age? And do you think your sampling methodology is representative of the stock? Yes, yeah, so, so what we're seeing in terms of numbers is a lot. Um, our, the, the amount of red snapper that we have seen over the years is the highest that's, that we've, we've ever had it. I remember when I was a grad student 20 years ago, going on these surveys and catching a red snapper was a reason to wake up people in the bunks and to, to tell them that you caught a red snapper. And now in some of the traps, we've gotten up to 90 or so that are there. So I think based on the depth uh, distribution of these red snapper, and we're working with uh, the group in Florida that's actually gonna give the next seminar series, I think. Yeah, the next one, um, looking at the red snapper count. And so they're, they're trying to explore some of these habitats that we might not, like the deeper waters, uh, the, the areas that are outside of the range of our traps, but we're not seeing preliminarily a lot of the fish out there. It seems to be that our trap is, is at least in the general area of where everything is. I'm sure there is some selectivity with the trap for some of those larger individuals, but as you saw from that video earlier, big fish can still get in this trap and we do catch big fish and we catch them pretty regularly. So it's not an, it's not an unusual thing for us to see them. So that's kind of where the assessment goes. And, and actually that selectivity curve that I showed you was the selectivity curve that they use in the red, snap, red snapper stock assessment for, for the Chevron trap. And so it's, it's attempted to be accounted for by utilizing methods after the fact. 
And our next question is from Dean. Um, it's kind of a two part question here. Is there an effort to employ machine learning models to visually ID and count fish species rather than having to do this via humans? And then the second part of that, are there any geophysical efforts to ascertain biomass estimates using acoustic methods? Yeah, so the first part question, I know in the Gulf of Mexico, they've been working on uh, some of the machine learning to identify fish. And it, as I mentioned before, it works okay. Um, it's not quite to the resolution that we need, but it's getting closer. And I hope at some point in the near future, it would be taken care of because that would be fantastic. Again, that's a huge time saver if we we could have um, these these videos read automatically. Um, in terms of acoustics, kind of the same situation almost with the machine learning is that they can they can do that, but we don't have good signatures for what different species look like. Not to mention the fact that as opposed to the Pacific where they use acoustic information for things like Pollock, those are swimming in the water column. A lot of these fish species are hanging pretty low to the ground. And so there's a lot of interference with, with acoustic signatures to try to pick up a fish that's just inches off of the ground versus what's just the bottom. So there's still, I think, a pretty long way to go with the, the fish species in this region, at least using acoustic surveys. Awesome. All right, we got another question, but before we move to the next one, um, while I do mind ending the screen share real quick, and I'm going to go ahead and put up um, just a quick, um, a quick slide on my behalf. Sure. Awesome. Uh, there we go. We should be good now. All right. Let me know when you can see my screen. We've got your screen, David. You got it. The webinar feedback slide up looks perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, just a quick intermission here. Um, this is a Sea Grant webinar series, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, and we this is a three-part series. So the next one will be on February 13th at 6 p.m. and is going to focus on um, the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program. And then the last one will be February 27th at 6 p.m. as well, and we'll focus on the Greater Amberjack Count. We've got some awesome um, guest speakers lined up for those as well. So definitely, if you registered for this event, you are registered for those as well. So try to tune into those. Um, but I wanted to put this slide up quickly because these are webinars we kind of made for you all. Um, so any sort of evaluation as to how they went is really appreciated so we can kind of refine things moving forward and just get a general feel for how you all like them. Did you learn something? Um, things like that. So I'll just leave this up here. We've got a QR code. Um, if you're interested and have, have the time, it's just really one to two minute quick, quick uh, form. Just fill that out to let us know how we did and if there's anything we can improve on. Um, but that's my spiel. I'll leave this up. Like, it looks like our next question is from Alexandra, and it is, um, with the video counts, how do you go about counting the fish in the video? I'm assuming it's inevitable to double count certain fish that are in the frame, then leave frame, then come back in the frame later. Correct. And so what they do to get around that is there's a couple methods. Uh, the one that they use in this region is basically they're taking screen grabs every 30 seconds and counting the number of fish that are in the screen at that time period. So each individual time period you're counting, you're not counting any fish double because it's only that what's in that screen at that time period. Uh, what happens when they're they're going through that process is they're taking these screenshot reads every 30 seconds for 20 minutes. So it ends up being 41 reads that they go through. And so while there's inevitability that you are counting the same fish more than once, they still that method still tends to track with abundance. So even if it's one, um, yeah, it's even if you're counting those fish more than once, you're also probably not counting other fish that are in there. And so it depends on the species that you're dealing with. So things like a lionfish that's relatively sedentary, it doesn't move around a lot, you're probably more likely to count those fish more than once versus something like a, an amberjack, which we've seen swimming around on a lot of these videos, 
and those are going to be constantly moving and constantly going in and out. So you're probably not going to count the same one twice, maybe, but the methodology still works out that even if you are counting the, the same fish, that still gives you this relative abundance difference because um, it's all it's all relative to other other traps. And so as long as they're consistent with the method that they're counting, that still gives an indication on if the if the numbers are higher or lower. All right. Um, I'm not seeing any more written questions. Oh wait, let's yes, there is one more, it looks like. Um, will any future survey sites slash previous sites take place on the Carolina Long Bay lease area? If offshore wind activities proceed here, will these be sites of interest for comparison for prior slash post development? Yeah, so that's where we're working through that right now. Uh, there is, it's minimal overlap with the, the proposed sites right now, but there are some sites that we have there. And so we're, we've been in discussions with the federal partners, with the, the wind, wind folks to kind of figure out a strategy to, to work through that. Um, a good thing with these traps though, is that it's slightly different. They're having problems with this up in the Northeast. It's because a lot of their surveys are trawl based. And so they're moving surveys that they're going over bottom that has, has equipment. And so they're worried about getting snagged, tearing up their nets, ruining the equipment. These traps are relatively simple in that they're they're dropped down and they stay in one spot. So even with even with the the wind potentially moving in, we still might be able to sample these same areas. Though it is going to be different because if you know anything about the the Gulf of Mexico and all the oil rigs, those attract fish. So what we're actually doing is it might not be the same apples to apples kind of comparison that we typically have when we're we're sampling consistently because we're introducing structures that might be bringing fish over to that area. So it's, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's it's still up in the air and we're working through that right now. Awesome, well, I'm not seeing any more questions um, on my end. Feel free to, Chris, Christina, if you're, if you're there, feel free to chime in if I'm missing something, but I'm not seeing much um, and I guess that kind of concludes things. Let me go ahead and just just a quick reminder of the upcoming webinars. So like I said, the 13th, we'll have the South Atlantic Red Snapper Research Program with our guest speaker, Dr. Will Patterson with the University of Florida. Um, he is obviously very heavily, he heavily involved with that project. Um, and then the Greater Amberjack Cat will be followed two, uh, Tuesdays later with Dr. Sean Powers and Mark Albans. Um, with the University of South Alabama. So that's just a reminder. We look forward to hopefully having a, a bunch of you return to that this webinar series. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. And Wally, we really appreciate you taking a chunk out of your evening to, to share some of the insight you have into reef fish surveying and, and answer some really awesome questions. So thank you all um, and have a great night. Thank you everyone for showing up.